So I guess let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, can everybody see that? It looks good. Okay, great. Awesome. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to course session three of the Imag Reimagining Assessment Practicum. Let's go ahead and get our little housekeeping details out of the way here. We'd like to remind everybody that you can post any feedback you have for this session uh, to the feedback and insights board uh, that you can access through the Reimagining Assessment Practicum Canvas site. And we'd definitely appreciate um, any and all feedback that you have as we'll also be presenting this uh, presentation during the winter and spring quarters. So whatever you have to say, we will use to improve our session. And also the Feedback and Insights Board has been really helpful for our colleagues leading the practicums that they can, you know, access your thoughts, address your needs, make timely adjustments to the practicum structure and or delivery as needed. So please uh, give us feedback on the Feedback and Insights Board. We also just want to remind everybody about these super, super helpful 30 minute consultations with um, one of our teaching experts, uh, Melissa Ko. These are 30 minute sessions where you can talk about any uh, aspect of alternative grading or assessment one on one with a learning expert. And this is just one of the really amazing resources that the practicum has to offer. So don't forget about those. All right, finally, um, welcome everyone. And thank you for joining us for course session three. What types of feedback can we use to assess and promote learning? So my name is Megan Fritz and I am a teaching track faculty member in the writing program. I've been experimenting with ungrading in my classes since the fall of 2020. I'll talk a little bit more about what that means for me later in the session, uh, but I'm delighted to be a part of this conversation and that's gonna explore the important role that feedback plays in any assessment system. Uh, but especially in classrooms experimenting with alternative assessment practices and process-based learning. So in addition to ungrading in my classrooms, I'm also working on a longitudinal study on the effects of ungrading practices in the classroom with my colleague Lisa Del Tordo, who's also joining us today. Um, and Kiki Zizamopoulos is going to be with us here too. So Lisa, Kiki, and I are part of a faculty discussion group that focuses on alternative assessment and how we use it in our classroom. So we've talked extensively, formally and informally, about the role that feedback plays in our learning systems. And we're looking forward to extending this conversation to all of you today. So Lisa and Kiki, would you mind jumping in and introducing yourselves real quick? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, I'm Lisa Del Tordo, she, her pronouns. And like Megan, I'm also teaching track faculty in the Cook Family Writing Program. I teach several undergraduate writing classes. Um, and these classes are all small seminar style and workshop style classes with about 15 to 16 students per section. And regular feedback is really essential for both promoting and assessing learning in all of those classes. And my approaches really focus on feedback that's individualized and also implementable so that students can grow you know, along the dimensions of our course learning objectives, and they can also notice and keep track of that learning themselves as we go through the quarter. And um, I'll pass the mic to Kiki next. Hi, everyone. My name is Kiki Zismopoulos. I am also teaching track faculty. I'm in the McCormick School of Engineering. Uh, so my role is actually half advising and half teaching. I teach the uh, first year design thinking and communication class that uh, you may hear about. Um, I have been questioning grades, uh, I think, since I was a college student, actually. <laughs> um, but I have formally experimented with ungrading starting in the winter 2022 informally before that. Um, and I'll share a little bit more about um, my approaches uh, later on during the panel, uh, but I'm looking forward to exploring the role of feedback in the assessment process with you all today. I'll hand it back to Megan. All right, thank you both. Um, so let's kind of talk about how this is going to go today. So we're going to begin by defining feedback and how feedback communicates information about learning differently than grades. We're also going to think of feedback as an important part of process-based learning, right? Now we're going to break down feedback into three different components. So peer feedback, instructor feedback, and students' own metacognitive self-feedback. We'll explore how these different facets of feedback can be used to more effectively communicate assessment, evaluate student work, and improve learning. 
Then we're going to transition into a panel discussion where Lisa Kiki, Lisa Kiki and I will uh, talk about the different ways that we practically implement several different elements of feedback into our classes in different ways. So just a quick uh, disclaimer here. So as part of the open educational resource element of this presentation, which asks us to record and share things uh, openly once the, the presentation is over, how we're going to handle this is we're going to record the first part of the presentation and the panel discussion. And at the close of our remarks, we're going to stop the recording Recording, ask you all to participate in a brief reflection exercise, and then we're going to open up the room and chat for questions regarding feedback. So in order for us to have a more open conversation, we'd like to wait to answer questions until we've stopped the recording of the session. So please feel free to add questions into the chat as we roll along. And once we turn the recording off, we'll answer kind of all the questions. Uh, we'll do our best, I guess, to answer all the questions that come up into the chat as they as they come up and then open it up to full conversation. So that's that's the system for today. So I'm going to talk for just a few minutes about these different aspects of feedback before we dive into our conversation today. So let's talk about defining feedback. What does feedback mean? Um, the reimagining assessment practicum right defines feedback as a process for helping a learner track how they're progressing towards a goal and what developmentally appropriate actions will advance their work towards that goal. The Stanford Teaching Commons defines feedback as strategies to help students understand their own progress and learn in a spirit of growth and improvement. And the Teaching and Learning Lab at MIT defines feedback as thinking about where the student is going, how the student is doing now, and what the next step is. So basically any learning center at any major university in the planet will have their definition of what feedback is somewhere on their website, right? But I think that the major commonalities among these differing definitions are, first, that food feedback communicates how students have and haven't reached the learning goals of the instructor. And two, that feedback ideally promotes a process-based learning where students have the opportunity to take the information, give it to them by an instructor, or as we're gonna discuss in this presentation, right, their peers or even their own self-reflections and taking all that feedback to improve their learning. So let's talk about how grades and feedback differ. So when we first started planning this session, we thought a long time about how grades and feedback communicate different information to students about their learning. So the first topic we want to tackle today is why that is and how exactly feedback communicates different information about starting student learning than grades alone can. So research has shown that grades are not actually an accurate measure of learning, right? So despite instructors' best efforts, grading ends up being comparative, arbitrary and inconsistent largely, right? So if you think about it, how we grade is based on our own kind of capricious determinations about what we think needs to be obsessed, right? And even objective forms of assessment, right? Like tests, right? Are based on selections of kind of arbitrarily chosen questions. So there's this inaccuracy, even though instructors spend so much time trying to articulate and create these super equitable, straightforward assessment systems, right? Grades just, uh, they're inconsistent at the best, right? Grades also don't communicate a student's learning, right? As much as their capacity for following instructions. That's what Jim, Jesse Sommel uh, says in, in Assessment Scholar, right? In another Assessment Scholar, Susan Bloom, she kind of echoes this thought that even with rubrics or something, that's where, you know, again, these, these heartfelt documents where instructors are trying to, to articulate and translate what they're looking for in assignments to students, right? Students kind of come to see rubrics or instructions as kind of a formula for success, right? Something that they can just check the boxes and do to get the grade they want, right? Rather than looking at those documents and information that instructors are trying to communicate as information they need to improve their learning. Um, it's been proven that grades don't communicate information effectively, right? They're simultaneously too simplistic and too complicated, right? So Samuel says that grades make something super complex like student learning into something numerical, right? So an 8 out of 10 or an 85%, which doesn't really give enough information, right? Versus grades can be way too complicated, you know, an AA minus, one of those, those magic grades that kind of hovers between both areas, right? Um, so these kind of, when, when grades give way too many gradations, they can be too complex for students. Um, 
Blum talks about how if the purpose of grades is to convey a student's adequacy or excellence, right, um, then grades don't do a very good job of that, right? If stepping back and thinking like what information is actually conveyed in an A? What do we learn from an A? What do we learn from a GPA of a student? And the, the answer there is kind of not much, not as much, I think, as students think these, these grades uh, deliver for them. And finally, grades don't reflect a student's holistic uh, learning context, right? So there's a lot of idiosyncratic, subjective, emotional characteristics of learning that just are completely silenced in, in, in a grade. So what's different then about feedback? How does feedback communicate differently? So grades, right, are signaling the end of a conversation. Students get a grade, they move on to the next assignment most often, right? But feedback continues a conversation, right, and helps guide future behavior. Um, the big difference that we're going to focus on today is the way that grades alone can kind of halt a conversation on student learning rather than opening up a dialogue between instructors, students, and their peers on how to improve and grow. So, right, broadly defined, again, feedback is information given to students about their performance that guides their future behavior. So it can set a path for students, it directs their attention to areas for growth and improvement, and connects them with these future learning opportunities, right? At the same time, there's an evaluative component to feedback, regardless of whether it's given with a grade. And effective feedback can tell students what they are or not understanding, where their performance is going well or poorly, and how they should direct their subsequent efforts. So in this way, feedback is really essential to students' learning and growth, right? Traditional grading lacks these feedback loops. If you all were able to um, attend Robert Talbert's keynote uh, presentation, right, he talks a lot about this opportunity for feedback loops. So feedback should inform students what they're doing well, what they need to improve, guide them on how to act on that information, and give them a chance to try again. So it's this kind of iterative process not just a one-off that a grade kind of tends to be. And finally, I think one of the, the most compelling aspects of feedback, um, I think, is that it gives way to this dialogue, right? Um, Jesse Sommel describes feedback as this mode of conversation between student and instructor and about the student's learning, right? So this exchange of instructor evaluation and feedback coupled with the students, maybe their self evaluation or a conversation of where they think they need to improve in a document, right? Those things together, the instructor's perspective and the student's perspective, helps open up a, a, a world of understanding between the faculty st and student about where the student is and where they need to improve. And it's, it's a, it is kind of a dialogue. It's a co-constructed way of thinking about improvement and, and working through this feedback loop. So we're going to talk about three different modes of feedback today, uh, kind of four, I guess. So instructor feedback, peer feedback, metacognitive self-feedback, and students' feedback to instructors. So real quickly, let's, let's start with instructor feedback. We're going to talk about formative feedback and summative feedback, right? And so formative feedback is part of a process-based learning curriculum. It, again, it informs students on what's good about where their work, where they need to improve, and actionable steps and opportunity for that revision. Um, it helps students see what they're understanding, what they're missing. And again, doing this formative feedback as part of a feedback loop where students can act on that um, is, is really effective. So there's a lot of ways that instructors can provide formative feedback in their classroom. This can be through synchronous learning conferences. So those can be one-on-one -on -one via Zoom, they can be one-on-one -on -one in office hours, they can be one-on-one -on -one, uh, just in in-person in conferences, right? Um, you can provide formative feedback by annotations and written notes on student work, um, audio memos to the students. I'm thinking of ways sometimes to go beyond just the text for different learners and, and for instructors themselves who might prefer talking out loud or talking through their feedback, doing that via a video recording. An audio memo is another way to give feedback. You can also think about giving formative feedback in small group meetings rather than one-on-one -on -one with the student, especially if classes are larger. Um, there's all kinds of ways to provide formative feedback in the classroom. When we're thinking about tips for uh, providing effective 
formative feedback, right? Uh, this is this is from Robert Talbert's uh, book, Writing for Growth. He talks about focusing on standards and growth, right? So thinking about feedback as not being the same thing as criticism, right? Feedback gives an opportunity for uh, solving a problem rather than criticizing. And it puts the emphasis on problem solving rather than on the individual themselves. So again, focusing on whatever the learning objective is, the learning standard is, how the student may or may not be meeting that, and then giving them opportunity to grow. Um, when giving effective formative feedback, um, it's important to ask questions and partner with the students. One way to do this, of course, is to ask a lot of questions. So phrasing your feedback in terms of questions rather than absolutes is one way to invite dialogue and, and greater understanding between the learner and the instructor. Uh, giving feedback often or creating this culture of feedback is, is, is an important way of establishing effective formative feedback practices in the classroom, right? So um, feedback doesn't just have to be for assignments, right? It can be kind of any time in the class. It can be during a class activity, during office hours, when class is ending or beginning. You can give kind of overview feedback to the whole class at one time in these different ways. It doesn't have to just be for big formal assignments. Um, and then this idea of kind of creating a, a climate in your classroom that invites feedback, right? Making feedback and revision kind of a normalized part of the classroom and a normalized part of learning. Um, I think especially at Northwestern, students have lots of anxiety around perfectionism and having to be the best version of themselves at all time, especially when their grades are at stake. And I think that cultivating a, a classroom that accepts revision and process as part of learning invites students to kind of take some of that pressure off and lean into the learning process a little bit better. Um, there's a, a wonderful essay by... Um, our our lovely um, colleague here at Northwestern, Dr. Chris Riesbeck. He's an associate professor in the Department of Elect Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at Northwestern. Um, Chris is part of Kiki and Lisa's and Mai's uh, assessment group that we've been running with faculty members. He has this great essay in the book, um, this collection, Ungrading, I think. Oh, you can't really see it, but Ungrading, Why Rating Students Undermines Learning and What to Do Instead. Um, he has this great essay where he talks about um, critique-driven learning. So this is his way of thinking about formative feedback. And what he did is he replaced grading with critiquing and continuous do review redo submission process so he that's how he set up a feedback loop for formative uh, uh, feedback in the classroom and it, it provides detail um, it's helpful it gives easily read qualitative and quantitative view of students progress accomplishments strengths and weaknesses um, so that's a really lovely uh, example that we can talk a little bit more about later if it's useful but I encourage everybody to read that essay in this, this book because it's really lovely all right, let's talk a little bit about a summative assessment and the difference between formative and summative assessments. So um, summative assessments, right, provide students um, a way of understanding how they've demonstrated that they've met a range of learning objectives um, at the end of a course or learning process, right? Um, these should align with course learning goals, build upon prior formative assessments, um, summative assessments, address how well the student's able to synthesize and connect elements of learning from the entirety of the course into kind of a holistic understanding, right? And provide, yeah, a holistic understanding. Um, so some examples of summative feedback, again, are exams, presentations, projects, portfolios. These are kind of like the final product, I would say, of a learning uh, goal, right? The final product that it's done, it's revised, it's submitted. Summative feedback gives, gives feedback on the, the whole process, the whole piece, right? Um, let's see. So let's talk a little bit about... Um, peer feedback, right? Uh, so peer feedback is uh, is a student to student kind of feedback, right? Um, and peer feedback is another way of implementing peer feedback in the classroom uh, that goes just beyond the instructor's feedback. 
So um, there are a lot of benefits of peer feedback. So uh, peer feedback has been kind of, it's been uh, proven to promote student learning. So when students give feedback on other students' work, they start to understand um, and process the course material in a better way. And as they're giving feedback, they tend to internalize the feedback that they're giving so that they then learn those skills themselves, or at least it's in the back of their mind as they're doing their work, whether that's on writing or or whatever, um, whatever they're learning in the class. It helps students, I think, understand how feedback communicates. So when they have to actually be the ones to give other students feedback, I think they start thinking more metacognitively about what feedback is and how it communicates and what's useful for both themselves and others to hear when giving feedback. Um, giving peer feedback in class, incorporating peer feedback allows students to augment their audience for their, their work, whatever that is, whether it's a paper or a project, um, beyond just the, themselves and the instructor, right? And it, it gives a larger audience for students. Um, peer feedback increases student agency. So by showing students that what they think is important um, and what they, you know, suggestions that they have gives them agency in their own learning, but also in the learning of others in the classroom. And again, it kind of decenters the instructor as the, the main uh, hierarchical figure of learning in the class, right? All of a sudden that's expanded out then to other uh, students in the class as well as themselves. Uh, peer fact, feedback, this is something Kiki, Lisa, and I have talked a lot about, really contributes to future professional development. Students are going to be asked in the real world, once they leave Northwestern and have their jobs, whatever that may be, they're going to be asked a lot to give feedback. And peer review kind of helps um, bake those skills into their learning system. It helps them develop those skills before they leave the, the campus, right? And finally, especially when... when um, uh, doing group assignments, group projects, peer feedback can really help professors in understanding the process between um, how students are seeing each other working and how um, we as instructors can help see them working. So it kind of demystifies a lot of the process when we can read how students are assessing each other and then we can intervene in different ways. And peer feedback doesn't have to just um, stick in the classroom with peer-to-peer uh, -peer tutoring in the classroom, right? There's all different ways that Northwestern offers opportunities for community-based feedback. So there's um, peer evaluations is one way. So this is another way of thinking of students, maybe even in the class, evaluating each other. This is beyond peer review, which is just giving feedback, but actually evaluating each other's performance on things. I tend to do this around the midterm and at the end of the quarter for my students thinking about um, how they're all uh, engaging with the course. We have like a community engagement guidelines and I ask students to give each other specific feedback on what their peers are doing well to improve the uh, engagement of the class and what they could be doing a little bit better. I do that at the midterm. So they're kind of evaluating each other um, and learning from each other. So taking a, you know the, the feedback into the evaluation assessment a little bit and giving students opportunity to do that. But then also thinking outside the classroom. So there's a lot of places on campus that offer peer-to-peer -peer feedback and ways that go outside the classroom. So the writing place is Northwestern Peer-to-Peer -peer Writing Center. Um, ASLA has a lot of resources, open tutoring, where students um, tutor each other on all different kinds of subjects. And then, of course, these peer-guided study groups are another way that students uh, can engage with peers to learn from each other. So peer feedback doesn't just have to be in your classroom. It can be a culture of feedback that, you, that we can nurture uh, beyond the classroom, too. Um, and then just a real quick note on, oh, wait, no, sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go to metacognitive self-feedback first. Um, so metacognition, right, is helps increase student learning. It's, it's metacognition, it's self-reflection, self-assessment. These feature prominently in a lot of alternative grading schemes. And self-reflection, right, is the process whereby students reflect consciously um, and intentionally with intention, right, on their learning. Um, Self-reflections um, help students learn more deeply about the concepts of the course, help them learn more deeply about themselves as learners, and gives them agency right in how they describe their learning to instructors. 
And self-reflection is another element of feedback that can be employed at multiple learning points throughout the quarter. Again, it doesn't just have to be at the end of a big learning point unit exam or whatever. Um, you can think of like in reflection in a first draft and a final draft, midterm self-reflections, final course reflections. Um, there's a lot of ways that self-reflection is it can be employed as a more equitable form of assessment of student work, right? Students' reflections can be used to guide the instructor's reading of their assignments. It allows for more individualized instruction from uh, instructors. Um, so self-reflection, I think, is a really important point, um, an important kind of feedback to consider in your grading schemes. And finally, we've we, we've um, noticed, at least Kiki, Lisa, and I, and all of our learning that sometimes the, the self-reflections that students produce, whether they be weekly, midterm, end of term, are actually a lot more useful to us in terms of how we can self, you know, how, how we can kind of self-correct, redirect the course than our CTEX. A lot of the times what we're asking students to think about in terms of their self-feedback and their self-reflection gives a lot of information to us about what's working in the course and what's not working in the course in a way more detailed um, way than we tend to get from the CTEX, which are so limited in what they can, what students can communicate to us. Um, so this is another kind of helpful benefit in terms of using self-feedback to actually improve your own courses as well. Not, it's not, it's not just for student learning, it's also, it can help us a lot too. Okay, I think I've talked enough at this point. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen, come back to you. Okay, wonderful. And what I'm going to do is we're going to kind of go through a couple different the discussion -y questions that we've set up. And I'm going to throw them in the chat so that you all can keep track of where we're at. Um, so let's see. So Lisa and Kiki and I are going to talk kind of practically about the particulars of how we are implementing feedback into our courses and assessment systems. So the first question I'm going to ask all of us to think about, oh, come back here, chat. Okay. So how does grading work in your class or classes? And how do grading assessment and feedback work together? So Lisa, do you want, mind taking us through this first one? Sure, yeah. So um, my assessment approach really starts with um, an intention to center individual learning, um, to decenter grades, and um, really to question the whole system of grades and grading as kind of an ongoing process. So. Um, I grade primarily around engagement and growth. So engagement in this sense is, are you the student doing the things I'm asking you to do throughout the quarter? Are you submitting stuff, you know, mostly roughly on time with academic integrity and contributing in some way to um, the learning community of the class? And then what I'm looking at for the growth piece of it is um, are you making improvements you know, from one draft to the next, uh, one assignment to the next, and over the course of the full quarter? So I keep traditional grades um, out of the class and away from students as much as possible throughout the quarter. As everyone here knows, um, I do have to assign grades at the end of the quarter, but I don't put um, numbers or letter grades on any assignments. Instead, the students get um, lots of feedback on all of those assignments. And on Canvas, they get notations of complete or incomplete. And um, all along the way, I'm making sure that students are getting a lot of qualitative and formative feedback so that they can take action on that. For example, to revise a paper in between drafts or you know, to transfer that learning from one assignment to the next. And then the approach also provides for students multiple kinds and sources of feedback. So, you know, as Megan talked about, in addition to getting feedback from me, they're getting feedback from several peers, 
and they're using self-reflection to review their own work and growth. And all of that feedback might come in different forms, like sometimes it's written feedback, um, sometimes it's in face-to-face -face conversation, sometimes there's a combination of those. And uh, one of the documents that I shared with you in the resources page on Canvas is an assessment memo for my college seminar, which gives um, an overview of my approach and also shows how I explain it to students. I'll also drop a link in the chat now, not that we should necessarily look at it now, but just so that you can have that document and keep track of what we're sharing with you. And um, I'll turn it over to Kiki next. Thanks, Lisa. To give you a little context about my class, it is, uh, as I mentioned, design thinking and communication. So students work in teams of four to solve a real world problem. So I'm assessing both at the individual level and at the team level. Um, I have a similar approach to Lisa, so I also use an assessment memo uh, early in class, and it outlines for students that their work is going to be assessed on engagement and growth in five categories, and these five categories map onto the focus of the class, which are team process and team reflections, their final deliverables, individual writing and peer feedback, they have to do a graphics or a, a sketching portfolio and then their individual contribution and self-reflections. And so you'll notice here that I'm intentionally making reflection part of what I'm looking for in when I'm assessing them as well. Um, one modification I have made to the assessment memo is that I put that students have 10 minutes, 10 days, 10 minutes, 10 days to resubmit incomplete work uh, as a way to keep them on track. So it provides a, a deadline for them. Mm -hmm. um, we discussed this memo in class. So I set aside time to discuss this approach, especially because I, I see many of these students in their very first quarter on campus. And so I wanna orient them that this may look different than some of their other classes at Northwestern. And I give them space to question the approach, uh, to express concerns, um, and to express how they think it might be beneficial for them. So, you know, taking class time to center assessment and talk about assessment also I find uh, creates a, a nice tone to the start of class. Um, feedback is provided throughout the quarter in the same way that Lisa mentioned, either writing, um, written, verbal, peer feedback. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the specifics of that uh, with the next question. Um, but with that, I think I'll pass it over to Megan. Yeah, thank you both so much. So in my classes, I, I I echo a lot of what Lisa and Kiki are doing. So I try to keep grades away from students as long as possible um, until the end of the quarter when I'm required to give students a grade. Um, so I don't give grades as we go throughout the class. And I don't ask students to think about their work in terms of grades as we go throughout the class. Um, so I give lots and lots and lots of formative feedback. So instead of letter grades, I'm giving just feedback. Um, and I do that both written and verbally. Um, and I follow this process-based learning system, again, to echo Kiki and Lisa, right, where students write a first draft, I ask them to peer review, they meet with me one-on-one -on -one to go over the writing, um, and then I ask them to revise. Um, and I ask that for that to be a meaningful revision. So a big, there should be a big change between the first draft and the second draft. It's not just like moving a sentence or two around there. It, it requires a lot of rethinking, a lot of reworking. Um, and if I don't feel like students have quite gotten that, I teach a lot of first year students. So sometimes they don't quite um, know how, what it means to revise, I think, especially for the college level. So I also will allow students, I'll just send it back and be like, hey, let's talk this over again. This is why I don't feel like this has a, is a substantial enough revision. I'll give them opportunities opportunities to do it again. Um, I'm not, I, 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 I'm not as organized as Kiki. I can't keep up with like, with, if I give them 10 days to do it, I just give them time to do it and they, it can be on their timeline. Otherwise I just forget about when it's due. Uh, so that's just me as a frazzled instructor. Um, 
but uh, I also ask students, so they revise. I also ask students to self-reflect at a, a lot of stages in the process. So after the first draft, I ask them to reflect on what, how they think they did, what they want to work on, what they want my help with, what they want their peers help with as we go into peer review and, and discussion about the work, right? And then I ask them in a, to do a reflection on the revision. What did they, what, how did they revise? What did they learn by revising? Um, and I'll talk a little bit, I'll talk a lot about this later, actually, when we talk about self-reflection in more detail, but like Kiki, that's a really meaningful part of my class and and learning how to re reflect meaningfully is a, a one of my big learning objectives for the class and I actually have students write out their own individual learning plan for my classes with their own goals set within my particular learning goals of the class so they can personalize it. And so as they're doing these reflections, I'm asking them to look back at their larger goals for the class and connect what they've learned via assignments to their larger learning goals. Um, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, let's talk a little bit more practically. Um, Kiki and Lisa, let's type our second question into the chat here. So literally, practically, how do you as an instructor give feedback? Which methods do you use? When? How often? Those kind of things. Kiki, do you want to jump in first? Absolutely. So I mentioned that students, um, I give them space to express concerns uh, early in the quarter. And one concern that often comes up is, if you're not giving me a grade, how will I know how I'm doing? Um, and my response to them is you will get lots of feedback. And so what that looks like in my class is students do primarily submit their work in Google Docs or Google Forms. And Google Docs provides me with a nice way to just directly comment on their work. Um, and I am able to, you know, ask questions, start a conversation, provide feedback. And then I will mark their work as, as Lisa said, as complete or incomplete with instructions on what they would need to do to convert an incomplete into a complete. Um, so that's one way is just directly in Google Docs. I either ask them to resubmit their work into the same assignment, but there are some cases, and I think I'm still working out the balance here. There are some assignments where uh, I, put a second version, like there is a separate assignment that says version two of this document. So the resubmission is actually built in as a separate assignment for them. Um, so in some cases, it's just resubmit to the same assignment in Canvas. In some cases, it's resubmit to when, when you see version two do. Uh, and like I said, I'm still kind of working out the balance of when it's better to do um, which of those. Another way that we give feedback is that twice during the quarter, we meet individually with each team. And in those team meetings, um, I find that verbal feedback works best. And so it is a conversation and verbal feedback about the documents they have submitted for that meeting. And students are required to take notes um, and kind of submit you know, what they have learned and what they're going to work on between one meeting and the next meeting. Um, I have also been surprised at, you know, when I'm using this model where there's no grade and just the feedback, how eager students are to make changes and, and fix things. So they'll ask like, wait, can I resubmit my work? So there's a little bit of at the beginning of the quarter, like they're, they're trying to figure out like, were you serious when you said that, right? So wait, I can resubmit. Um, and they comment that that extensive feedback that they get is critical to their learning. And so I think I'll close with two student quotes that I have that have come in through these um, self-assessments. So one student said, one of my favorite aspects about ungrading is the frequent feedback I receive. I can use the reflections and suggestions from the professors to directly edit my work and not only fix mistakes, but remember the corrections for next time so I don't make the same mistakes again. With a traditional grading scale, feedback on individual work is not always available. So there's not an opportunity to directly enhance my skills. And then I'll offer you a second quote from a slightly more skeptical student. Um, this student said, it grew on me. I didn't expect to feel motivated to complete assignments to the best of my ability, but the ungrading and feedback and correction model actually makes me do my best on every assignment. And so I think the I'll, I'll close with those two student voices. Um, I will pass it off to Lisa. Yeah, I love those quotes. Um, so I give, as I mentioned, feedback both in 
real-time conversations with students as well as in writing, but I don't necessarily do both for the same assignment or at the same point in one assignment. For example, for um, the major writing assignments that students have, I'm giving feedback on the first drafts in conversation during one-on-one -on -one conferences, and then I give feedback on the final drafts in writing. So for those one-on-one -on -one draft conferences, by the time students come to me for those meetings, they've actually already gotten feedback on their first drafts from at least three peers. So when I sit down with them one-on-one, -on -one, um, we talk about that feedback that they already have. I offer some additional suggestions to, imp to improve their drafts, and then I help them to synthesize everyone's comments and figure out how to implement all of that into a final draft. Um, those conferences are typically around 15 to 20 minutes each. And I do those about two to three times per quarter, depending on the class, depending on what the assignments are. And I find it really helpful to give students um, some structured ways to prepare for those conferences. So um, I'm going to post a link in the chat. And this also um, is going to be in um, the Canvas resources section. This is a conference prep form that I use. And you'll see, if you take a look at that form now or later, you'll see in the form that I ask students to basically just take some notes in advance of their conference about questions like what's working well in your draft? What do you want to work on? What questions do you have for me? And I see this as a way of sort of preparing them to have a real conversation with me about their writing rather than the kind of interaction where um, where I might be positioned as like the feedback giver, right? And a student's only role is to receive that feedback. I'm trying to get them away from that. And so giving them some way to prepare for it so that they can come in and um, engage in a conversation really helps. And then with the final drafts, as I mentioned, you know, I, I give written feedback for those on Canvas. And I have kind of a formula that I follow just to organize my written feedback, um, which helps to make it all more manageable for me too. So I try to do, I usually start with, you know, three or four strengths of the final draft, right? Which might include like even strengths of the process that they've gone through, things that I notice about changes that they've made that have improved the draft. Um, and then I'll do a, a section with another two or three things that they could improve if they were either to continue iterating on this paper, or I might sometimes frame that as like things to keep working on in their future writing. Um, and then I'll also, when I do those, I'll also include a brief section of feedback for the class overall. Um, and it might be anything from, you know, you've com completed all the assignments so far and I see real growth, right, to, um, I, there was one that I just wrote a couple of days ago that was something like, you know, I really appreciate all the insightful comments you make during class discussions. And I also noticed that you've got these two assignments missing. Please be in, you know, two other assignments missing. Please be in touch with me about making those up. And then, you know, I end it with some sort of invitation to reach out if they want to discuss it. And I think, um, you know, I'm I'm focusing more on kind of the bigger assignments. There's a lot more I could say about, you know, quicker feedback that I give on smaller assignments, but I don't want to take too much time for that now. If that comes up in, in Q&A, that would be great. But um, I think the last point probably I want to make for this question is that it can be really time consuming to do all of this, but there are a lot of ways to make it manageable. So one example is, you know, when we have those draft conferences, I'm not commenting on everything that I would improve in the draft, right? I'm choosing a few things that I think will make the biggest difference in the one week that they have between one draft and another, which means I can reasonably get through an individual conference in 15 or 20 minutes. Um, I also used to do a lot more one-on-one -on -one conferences at other stages of their projects. For example, when they're working on a research paper, right, there's a point where they have um, a bunch of research notes, they have annotated bibliographies, and they have to figure out how to get 
from there to a first draft of a paper. I've converted those now to uh, community feedback sessions or group conferences where I meet with three or four students at a time and their peers and I uh, will give ideas to help each student move forward. And I've found that those actually save a good amount of time, right? A group of three students takes about 30 minutes, a group of four, about 40 minutes. Whereas when I used to do those as individual conferences, it was like a good 15 to 20 minutes per individual student. So lots of little, you know, lots of little tricks like that for making it all manageable. Um, and again, I'd be glad to talk about any more of that, any of the more details of that in the Q&A, but I wanna pass it back to Megan now. Yeah, thank you so much, Lisa. I'm obsessed now with that group conference idea. That's a great idea. I'm gonna do that going forward. Um, so I just, to, again, to echo a lot of what Lisa and Kiki have said. So for feedback, I'm using for the first time this quarter, I'm trying to do everything in Canvas. I used to be old school. I would give everybody in track comments uh, in a Word document and then email it back to them as a PDF uh, individually. And I realized that students hate checking their emails. So I was like, okay, this quarter, I'm going to try to do everything in Canvas. And I think it's working. The only thing that drives me crazy is I can't tell if they've seen it. And depending on their notifications and the way they have them set up for Canvas. I don't always know if they're notified when I'm writing back to them. Uh, so that's something that I'm, I'm playing with and learning this quarter. But um, I, again, teach writing. So I'm doing a lot of written feedback in Canvas. And, and I do lots and lots of in-text comments. Um, I'm not one of those. For me, it takes a million years for me to write the really smart chunk of text letter at the end that gives high level, here's what you need to work on, boom, boom, boom. I do that much better verbally in conversation with the student. So I do lots of kind of in-text comments when I'm giving work, uh, giving feedback on written work. Um, and I try to make them very question-based, right? Like, oh, what do you mean here? I'm a little confused. How does this relate to the sentence above? Or what is this sentence doing differently than the sentence above? Things like that that are just asking questions of the student instead of trying to say, you know, this is good, this is bad. Although I do, I do spend a lot of time um, when I'm giving feedback on student assignments, calling out what I think they are doing well, especially in something like writing. I think it's such a tough discipline. Students are often really discouraged about their writing. I think it's important to call out what students are doing effectively. Um, I think that's just as important as it is for them to know what they're doing well as it is for what they need to work on. So I try really hard to have a, a positive kind of critique and I'm calling out good things as often as I'm calling out suggestions. Um, I've tried doing memos. I had an injury a couple uh, quarters ago where I, for the, that coincided exactly with when I was getting the students first drafts back. So I couldn't type with my right hand. Um, so I had to do voice memos um, to students where I kind of talked through their paper with them. And I found that students actually really liked that. It was really difficult for me. I am not a super verbal person. I'm not the most articulate person in my words, as you all probably noticed by now. I'm much more coherent, much clearer when I'm, I, have, I have time to write it out and think it out to students. So I think that my written feedback is more valuable in some ways than the than the voice memos, or at least it's, it's harder for me to do a voice memo. So I try to supplement that then by with all my written feedback that I get to students especially on the first draft. So they get written feedbacks on a first draft and then they come to my office, right? And we have a one-on-one -on -one conference where we can talk out uh, things conversationally. Mine are a little bit more directed, I think, than it sounds like Lisa's conferences are. Um, I am kind of a feedback giver in those moments, uh, but because I'm asking students throughout the quarter to really assess themselves and really get the agency to them and how they're evaluating their work. Um, I like to give a, be a little bit more directed in the way that I'm giving feedback in between the first draft and the revised draft because I'm afraid if I'm too loosey-goosey, they'll be like, ah, when am I learning at all? So I use the, the, the conferences as a time where I can be a little bit more directive in terms of the feedback that I'm getting. But at the same time, I try to, you know, make that conversational with the students. So my favorite conferences, of course, are ones where, you know, I suggest a question or suggest an idea and students take it in a completely different direction than they would have, you know, in the paper anyway. So between the two of us talking together, something something new emerges from the conversation. So I, I, ideally, that's that's what happens in the conferences. Um, 
I also give feedback on students revised drafts. And what I try to do is give kind of a summative assessment where I, you know, how I think that they grew throughout that assignment based on what they're saying. I also try to give feedback for future assignments. And um, when I'm doing it the best, I'm looking back at their learning goals for the specific assignment that they have in their learning plans and trying to connect to them. This is how I think you might work towards this going forward as the quarter goes on. These are things where I think you made a lot of progress already. Keep working on this. So I try to give, uh, you know, not just kind of summative, this is what you did, but also formative, here's what you can do going into future assignments. Um, I've also started using um, complete and incomplete in Canvas. That's just the best way that I've found. Um, I, I try to, like I, I, I tell my students, as long as they finish the assignments according to the criteria, they've done it. That's all they need to do, right? There's no, that's an A basically, right? There's no, um, there's no bells and whistles to go through. So I've started marking complete versus incomplete. And then if they get an incomplete, they know that they need to go back and fix it. Um, I asked students in terms of feedback to um, do a midterm kind of self-evaluation, which again, we'll talk about when we get into self-evaluation time. Um, but I also then asked, I meet with students one-on-one -on -one around the midterm and give feedback kind of, again, summative, formative, summative on how I think students have been, you know, performing in the class so far in conversation with their own self-reflections and, and feedback for, for going forward. Um, but yeah, I think that's, that's kind of how I do it. Uh, we're going to go into kind of a sub- question here. So uh, how do students typically respond to the feedback that we give them? So giving feedback instead of grades, for example. Um, let's see, I think Kiki, you were first on this one. Yeah, I think um, I may have covered this actually with the two student quotes. So I may have already answered that question before, um, but generally, you know, students respond very well. They say that it reduces their stress. Um, I can actually pull, I'll just pull one more student quote that I have. Um, the class structure that focuses on growth rather than the grade helps me learn more effectively. I could be more proactive in my own learning and growth, and it helps me follow the iteration process rather than trying to be perfect every time. Um, so I think what I wanted to communicate there with that quote is that what I see from students is that they are focused more on the process and the iteration and the emphasis of the design process, which is, you know, prototype, test, revise. Um, and so I'm kind of seeing that with their learning as well, which is um, the in the best case scenario, what I, I hope I would see. And I think I will pass it to uh, Lisa. Yeah, so everything you said, Kiki, really rings true for me too. And I know um, also from talking to you, Megan, about this, that my students have similar responses to yours as well. So, so I think I'll just add one thing here that I've started to notice that seems really cool to me in the past couple of years. Um, I've been hearing and from students and then also reading in some of their written comments. Um, what So it seems to be that this community-focused feedback approach in combination with avoiding traditional grades on assignments might be shifting actually how much they pay attention to, um, engage with, and value the feedback they're getting from people other than me as the instructor slash giver of grades. Um, so I pulled a quote that came up recently in a student's mid-quarter feedback that I wanted to read to you. So this is in response to a question about how they're experiencing our feedback and assessment system. And uh, this student wrote, the system has been really supportive for growth in particular. While my experience has still been one of hard work and difficult projects, the growth has been pretty unique. The reduced power of the teacher as a grader allows useful feedback from my peers in addition to teacher feedback. In this way, I have constantly focused on improvement from various perspectives. So I'm interpreting this to mean that 
this system that's focused on feedback and not grades um, facilitates for students more meaningful peer review because the instructor's relative power as reviewer is repositioned. And that in turn, I hope, makes all the feedback that they're asked to give, which is a significant amount, and all the feedback that they're receiving really worth the time and effort that everyone puts into it. And Megan, I'll pass it back to you next. Yeah, and just to kind of add on to that, I think that sometimes students um, can be a little skeptical about how ungrading or alternative assessment is going to work for them in the class. Um, and I found that especially in the way that I give feedback as it as we get through the quarter, students kind of ease in and they realize once we get through that first assignment that I'm not actually going to pull the rug out from under them, that this is just how the class is going to work, that they're going to get feedback and they're going to have opportunity to revise it. And once they revise it, as long as they, you know, have revision, revised well and, and reflected about it, like that's it. We move on to the next assignment. And I think that sometimes it takes students uh, an assignment to kind of get into that groove and to really kind of trust the feedback. But I find that going into other subsequent assignments, um, then I really see the growth, right? So between the first assignment, the second assignment, the third assignment, and even between the first assignment and the midterm reflections, I see them kind of trusting that, oh, all I need to do is learn, and all I need to do, it's like a ton of work and a lot of critical thinking for them to implement feedback, right, in a, in a, in a constructive way. But I, I think that once they can just trust that the feedback is there to guide them and it's not punitive and it's there to help their learning. And once they get through that first round, I found they really, um, they really, um, I don't know, just enjoy the process a lot more and trust the process a lot more. Okay, so let's... Um, pop to peer review because that's kind of a, a thorny thing sometimes it might be well worth talking about um so our next question is going to be how does peer review or community-based feedback uh work in your classes logistically practically pedagogically lisa you want to start with this one yeah so i'll start with um the basic structure of my um, community feedback process. So it requires that for every major assignment, students get feedback from me, from a stable peer review team of three or four students who work, are working together all quarter, and then also from one or two other students who they don't work with regularly. And I have a pretty prescribed procedure to follow once they have a first draft in place. So that draft gets submitted um, on Canvas. And then, it, you know, with the using the peer review function on Canvas, it gets distributed automatically to me and to that all the members of that stable peer support team. Um, each teammate then reads the other's drafts and they fill out a form answering some questions for each teammate's draft. I'll come back to that form in a minute and I'll share a sample with you also. Um, they send those forms to their teammates and to me, and then they actually have to meet outside of class for a peer review discussion. Um, at some point after that discussion, usually a day or two later, is when they're meeting with me for those one-on-one -on -one conferences that I talked about, and then they work on revisions. Um, and that form that I mentioned is something that I call a community feedback and reflection form or CFR form. Um, link is in the chat now. So um, the form includes questions about the paper draft, um, you know, including questions about process, content, organization, academic integrity. It's specifically not set up like a rubric because I really want it to function as a way to help students give and receive meaningful qualitative feedback without points or grades. So they complete these forms for their peers first drafts. And when they do the forms, I tell them that they should just take brief notes in response to each question. I really, I don't want it to be overwhelming or so burdensome that they just won't do it. Um, 
but also the the notes on the form are just a starting point point for that peer feedback right when they get together for a real time conversation about it they can use those notes they've written as a basis for that conversation um and then also during that week when they're in between drafts, I, I try to get them to connect during class time with uh, one or two other students who aren't on their regular peer support team. And I'll give them, you know, like 20 minutes during class um, one day to quickly look at like one small piece of a partner's paper. And then I get, I'll give them a few guided questions um, that they can chat about during class time. I don't, I don't probably want to take up too much time to talk in, in detail about that now, but that's another document that I've posted, um, in the resource section on Canvas, just an example of how to do that. And then all along the whole quarter, one of the things that I'm really trying to emphasize about the community feedback model is this idea that they're going to grow as writers when they get feedback from a community of readers, but also that, you know, critically engaging with others, with other people's writing is going to improve theirs as well. Megan? Yeah, I, Lisa and I have such similar ways of, of doing peer review that I, I won't add too, too much here, except for that one of the things that I try to do, um, because I have writing center training in me and I help direct the writing place here on campus. One of the things that I do to help introduce peer review in my class is I actually assign an article that we assign to the writing tutors at the Northwestern Writing Place to, um, to get them started on how to give feedback on writing rather than edit writing. So it's this kind of canonical piece in writing center studies. And I give that to my students and ask them to consider what um, help, helping a student on feedback or helping a student with feedback during peer review looks like versus just editing for like a small comma or something, you know, a grammar things. Again, students I find often aren't comfortable with peer review at first because they don't know how to do it. So I spend a little bit of time uh, introducing ways of giving feedback to students. Um, so that's kind of something different that I do. Um, and I know Kiki, you have a, a different system of doing this on the design side of things. Would you jump in? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so in the um, design portion of, of design thinking and communication, we implement peer review. And one thing I want to say here is, you know, the the what that you might do is is peer review. Like, you know, that that's the the technique I'm using is peer review. But what I find particularly important is how you implement that and how you as an instructor talk about that because it shapes the way in which the students engage with peer review. Um, and so by that I mean when I am introducing, um, they do peer review two primary times, one on their um, prototype and then one on their poster, which is communicating um, uh, their, their final design. I, when I present it to the class, I say, our goal here is to elevate all teams, right? We are, we're, we are a, a group of people that are somewhat experts in this topic, but we haven't been working specifically on the ideas that this team is working on. So we can see their their blind spots or we can see you know what they might have missed. And so our role here is to help and elevate all of the work that the peers are doing. And I think the reason I bring that up is I think it's important as an instructor to frame the role of peer review so that, that students kind of understand it's not a competition, um, that we're here to provide support. And I also tell students that they're running the show. And so I don't jump in with my own feedback. I want to put the peer feedback front and center. So I'm quiet <laughs> and then I wait out the awkward silence until people start chiming in. And then it just snowballs from there and they have this really engaging conversation and going back and forth with each other um, about the design or the poster design or, or whatnot. So um, that's that's the kind of primary way it works. And so it's it's in in class live peer feedback. Megan, I'll pop. Yeah. So I think I want to make sure that we have time to get to everybody's questions and things. So we're going to kind of wrap up here with the question on self-reflection. So the last of the three major feedback types we, we talked about. So what role does self-reflection, metacognitive self-feedback and self-reflection play in your assessment system? And I think I'm designated to go 
first on this one. Um, Self-reflection plays kind of an outsized role in my classes for sure. So um, as I mentioned earlier, I asked my students to create an individual learning plan for the class. And um, this is a big document. I'm actually, I'll, I'll go ahead and throw my current version in the chat so you all can see it. It's also on the Canvas um, page under resources for the session. Um, but I asked students, basically I have learning goals for the course, right? Five different course learning goals. And what I do in this document is I copy and paste them into a template. And I ask students basically to think about their strengths and weaknesses in each area. So their, their perceived strengths and weaknesses. So I ask them to assess where they think they are right now, where they've been in the past, where they think they are now, and what they want to learn particularly in this class. And the way that I, the reason why I like to do this learning plan is that it gives students an opportunity to think about what they really want to get out of the class. And some student, you know, students come in with all different levels of reading expertise, thinking expertise, writing expertise, right? And this allows them, maybe some students are really strong readers and that's not something they need to focus on super hard in my class, but they really want to improve on their speaking skills or presentation skills or writing skills. The learning plan allows them space to make their own goals within, um, within what I'm hoping they're going to get out of the class. So it allows them to kind of individualize what they're hoping to learn in a way that I could never really articulate or learn on my own without this document. Um, and what I do is I, they, they fill out this document. This is the first quarter that I've asked them to be broken it up. So I traditionally ask them to write this entire document in the first week, and they don't like that because it's very hard to think this hard and reflect on so many different questions. And I've gotten lots of feedback from many small group analyses from the Searle Center with my classes that the ILP is too long. It takes too long in the first week. So I've broken it up into manageable chunks. So I asked them to bring, um, you know, little parts of it completed to class. And we talk about it with their peers. We do stuff in class and it gives them maybe two full weeks to get through it rather than the first week. And that's that seemed to be working this quarter. We'll see. I have an SGA tomorrow, so we'll see what they think. Um, but in addition to the ILP, what students do for me is they write these kind of process letters um, every week. So I call them their Sunday summaries. And it's just some kind of short informal prompt. I have, um, I'll ask them something about what they learned during the week, tie it back to the goal in your ILP. Where did you make progress this week? Where do you still need to work? I often ask them to think about their engagement in terms of participation. How did you participate in class? How did you foster community this week? And they just write these informal letters to me and I write back to them each week. It's really fun. And for me to do that, it's a really informal way for me to just, you know, uh, communicate individually with students. I think they appreciate it, especially in these big, big classes. They don't always get that kind of individualized attention. Um, and then I asked students to do a, a midterm reflection. So we're coming up on that this week. I asked them to go back into their ILP in a different color, choose three of the different goals and assess where they are, where they've been, what they want to do the rest of the quarter. Um, so that's kind of fun. And then finally, at the end of the quarter, they have their big self-reflection, final self-review, self-assessment. Um, and I ask them to basically, it's like, it's like the ILP in reverse. So they assess themselves rather than setting their goals. Um, and it's, they're usually really fun. I ask students to set their own grading scale. So I give them like my baseline and expectations for the course, basically everything that's in the syllabus. And I ask them to add their own assessment. How will they know when they've learned um, and what, what constitutes an A and a B, which is really fun for them to read. And we have a final conference and we talk about it. And that's kind of how it works. So it's really completely built into the structure of my class, self-review and self-assessment, um, which is how I've kind of mitigated a lot of that uncertainty that might come from not having grades in the class. So even though they're not getting grades, we're kind of constantly every week reflecting on learning and they're getting feedback from me informally and informally. Um, Lisa, do you wanna chime in? Yeah, so I have students doing self-reflection and self-assessment for all of the major individual assignments, and then also um, broader self-reflection and assessment of their learning at a few key points in the quarter. So for those individual assignments, they reflect on um, both a first draft and also a final draft by completing those forms that I showed you earlier, those community feedback and reflection forms for their own papers. Um, and then they also, you know, bring those reflections to their conferences with me. And I think that these assignment level reflections help them 
to see how their paper, like an individual assignment, a paper has grown from one draft to another. And then also thinking a little bit bigger, what lessons they've learned about writing or research in the process of working on that paper. And then um, around weeks, I usually do this around weeks four, eight, and then during finals week, they do a bigger picture reflection and assessment of their um, growth and engagement along the broad, like broad categories of learning objectives. So for example, they're discussing how they've grown as writers, as researchers, um, as readers over a matter of weeks. And in these reflections, I also ask them to give themselves a course grade and to write a couple of paragraphs justifying and explaining that grade to me. Um, Kiki, I know you do those kinds of reflections as well, and our approach in that is very similar. So I don't want to overlap too much. I think it makes sense maybe to hand off to you now. Sure. Uh, so in, in my class, um, the way I often describe uh, the self-assessment is they say, you know, one of the things we're learning in this class is how to make evidence-based decisions that will lead to the final prototype. And then the same thing applies with their learning. So we're doing ungrading, you're doing the self-assessment, but I want those self-assessments to be evidence-based. I want them to be, to say, I'm, I think I deserve an A because of X, Y, and Z and have concrete um, things to show, to show me that kind of demonstrate their learning. And so the way this works is that throughout the quarter, they're um, filling out a, a design journal where I ask questions, you know, what did you learn about? What are your thoughts about? Um, read this article and explain, you know, so they have this really nice running document of their thought process of, of what they've learned, um, how they've changed their mind throughout the quarter. And then in weeks four, seven, and then at the end of the quarter, I say, look back at that document as a reminder of what you've learned and then do the self-assessment, which asks them to say, you know, what would what grade would you give yourself if you had to and why? Um, and what do you think are the top things you've learned? And so I have these sort of checkpoints at week four, week seven, and then at the end of the quarter. Um, and so I'm trying to, to mirror, you know, we're doing this evidence-based decision-making for the design process, but also this evidence-based um, decision-making for your grades as well. And it provides me, the last thing I'll say about this is I feel like I have gotten to learn, to know my students so much better uh, in, in reading what they write in these reflections um, and reading through their their design journals. And I'll just drop in the chat, the first link is the assessment I use in weeks four and seven. And then the second link is the end of quarter self-assessment. Um, and I think I will leave it at that. Okay, wonderful, Lisa Kiga. I think we've reached the end of what we were going to kind of talk about all three of us together. So I think we should go ahead and move into just kind of a self reflection for everybody. We'll just do a quick, this will only take two or three minutes. We want you to think about or have time to think about um, how do you currently implement feedback in your classroom? And then no matter what your teaching context or the size of your course, what's one area, whether that's instructor feedback, peer feedback, sub metacognitive self-feedback, et cetera, that you would like to change, experiment, or implement um, in your classroom, maybe brainstorm a couple ideas for what that might look like. And then in the next two or three minutes, we'll just open up our conversation to um, the group and we'll, we'll answer any questions that you may have. 